Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Welcome everyone back to another episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. I am joined today by Katie Strang to talk about breaking the stigma, supporting athlete mental wellness. Welcome, Katie. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Arden. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to give our listeners a little bit of background on you just so they know a bit about your story. So Katie is the senior enterprise and investigative writer for The Athletic, where she specializes in covering the intersection of sports and social issues. Um, with covering issues like the last Larry Nassar scandal, she was nominated for the Dan Jenkins Medal of Excellence in Sports Writing in 2019. She was also a nominee in 2021 for the National Sports Writer of the Year by the National Sports Media Association. Um, and certainly you've spent a lot of your career, Katie, focused on issues around sexual abuse and gendered violence. So I'm gonna jump right in. I mean, it's impressive what you've been able to cover and I imagine doing so as a journalist presents some challenges. How do you think about athletes and mental wellness now versus where we were five to 10 years ago? drastically different. Um, you know, I had this conversation with a colleague recently just about, you know, when you're a sports writer, you generally go through like a natural progression of, you know, you're maybe a general assignment reporter at first, then you become a beat writer before a national writer columnist and so on. Um, and I was saying, you know, one of the toughest things is covering a beat when you're covering one team on a daily basis and you're around the same group of people all the time. And I said, you know, one one thing that I wish I would have had a better handle on that I'll give my younger colleagues a tons of credit, they are much more aware of and cognizant of in their own coverage is just like the mental health aspect of playing sports at a high level and dealing with, you know, a tremendous amount of scrutiny and pressure and expectations. So I'm glad that the conversation is moving toward a place where we do look at the athlete experience much more holistically than we have in years past. That's fantastic. Do you actually think players get more support for these issues? And what about their family members? I mean, a hundred percent for the players themselves at the very least, you know, I think we've seen leagues and teams uh, much more open you know, about the need for mental health support and infrastructure and resources. And, you know, we've seen sort of official channels and pipelines and resources made available to players, um, which I think is, you know, really important because it's one acknowledging that, you know, this is a sort of a normal part of performing at, you know, the optimal level is like taking care of your mental health as well as your physical and emotional health. Um, and then also, you know, providing the resources needed. Now, that's not to say that it has been completely destigmatized, and um, you know, some of the barriers toward seeking help have been completely eradicated. But I do think that there have been significant strides, and I think that's largely been player-driven. I think players have been much more open to talk about their experiences with mental health, and I think that has really. Um, stress the need for those resources in that emphasis to become a mainstay in modern sports. You address this in your answer a little bit, but I'm curious to dig in a bit more. Do you think there are risks for people publicly owning their story? Does the public view their potential for performance differently if a player comes out and says, geez, I'm struggling with depression or a substance use issue? You know, How is that received and what are the, the risk that a player might face in your from your perspective? I definitely think there are risks involved and I wish that wasn't the case, but I think it would be disingenuous to not acknowledge that that still is the reality to some degree. Um, you know, I remember doing an interview with Robin Leonard, um, who's been a terrific uh, and very consistent advocate for mental health and been very, you know, open about his own struggles 
And he said, you know, point blank, like, I know that this has cost me in my career, like it has cost me contracts, it has probably, you know, cost me either term or dollars and um, that it has probably affected the way that he's been viewed by certain organizations. Um, but, you know, I think he also sees a tremendous value um, on a personal level in being honest. I think that's helped hold himself accountable and kept him you know, in a place where he can stay healthy um, and let the people around him know what he's dealing with. And I also think there's like a sense of, hey, I don't really want to go to an organization that's not going to be supportive and sort of evolved in how they think and treat mental health and how they treat players who mm -hmm. are dealing with those issues. So in some ways, yes, there are risk involved, um, but I think that most of the people that have come forward would tell you that there can be some real benefits to talking about it publicly as well. Interesting. Have you seen players need a certain type of specialized resource? You know, how important from your perspective is it that the either the therapist who's working with them or the facility they might go to has experience dealing with people in the public eye or who have, um, you know, who have been professional athletes? How specialized do you think the resources need to be for this population? Pretty specialized. I mean, it, it's a very unique circumstance to be in. Um, you know, you have a very short window generally to capitalize on your talent and what you've been working your whole life to achieve. You know, just I'll throw this out there for I think the average NHL like career span is less than five years. So you have a very short window um, to try to capitalize on your earning power um, as much as possible. And you're doing so, like I said, under intense scrutiny, intense pressure, in some ways, unorthodox environments. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get traded on a dime. You will have to uproot your family. That You might be away from your family and your support system for long stretches. You add in COVID, and that certainly complicates the dynamic. So I do think, you know, even just like social media, the, the thing mm -hmm. that po professional athletes, um, the type of you know, online vitriol and abuse that they have to endure, you know, compared to the common person, it, it's different. And um, some people think, you know, if you make a lot of money or if you have name recognition or you're a famous athlete, that you're immune from mental health issues. And that's simply not the case. Have you seen patterns just in your reporting when you were of players who seem to do better at navigating these challenges versus others, you know, is there characteristics that you can say, geez, you know, they, the people who possess these types of personality traits or these type use these types of tools seem to be able to weather some of these issues that you're talking about, the social media pressures, the financial, the family ones better than others. I would say I generally get the sense that people who have been open about their experience um, feel in some ways unburdened by having to sort of keep it under wraps or keep it secret or hide it. Um, I do think that helps like lighten the load and, you know, make sure that they get the help that they need. Um, and I think the biggest thing is like whether or not you have people around you who are willing to be a system of support, you know? I mean, I think it takes a tremendous amount of resilience, I think, to work um, and deal with, you know, mental health issues. And I think the more, you know, support and resources that you can add into the equation, the better the outcome, generally. Mm -hmm. You switching gears a bit, it certainly seems as though some of the cases and the stories you've covered have been of sensitive nature. How have you navigated these types of issues when you're interviewing someone? You know, how do you think about doing trauma informed reporting? How do you think about talking to a victim without risking, you know, triggering them and, and having them feel re traumatized? Yeah, that's a great question and something that I didn't have a ton of experience with, you know, early in my career. And I wish I would have known more about it and learned more about it on my own. But I, I probably didn't really even understand what the term trauma informed reporting really meant um, until my experience covering the Larry Nassar case and learned from some really wonderful, knowledgeable people with expertise in this area, um, people that handled the case and, and applied, you know, 
trauma-informed uh, investigation techniques and prosecution techniques and stuff of that nature. But, you know, I think the most important thing that I always try to remember is, you know, when you're dealing with someone who's suffered a trauma, that that is a very personal and private thing and that belongs to them and it can be painful and something that they've kept private. But, you know, I always try to remember that I am not entitled to someone else's pain. And so it's on me to earn their trust um, to be able to share um, that, you know, incident or trauma or experience um, and that, you know, building a foundation of trust, um, you know, comes from making a person feel comfortable, making a, a person feel heard, um, you know, not asking questions that are, you know, have value judgments, not mm -hmm. asking questions that are trying to steer someone one way or the other, you know, a big thing with any sort of, you know, sexual assault or domestic violence, it's, there's a big element of control. And mm -hmm. um, for people that have had repeated exposure to that or any at all, um, you know, they've had a semblance of power taken away from them. So I think you want to try to give as much back to them that you can, which is to say, hey, you know, we can kind of do this interview on your terms. Like if you want to just talk on background first, just to get to know each other, if you want to meet in a neutral spot where you feel comfortable, um, if you want to take it in really small doses. So if you get kind of overwhelmed by emotion that you can step away and take some time and regroup um, and just being really sensitive to their basic humanity and trying to treat reporting um, with compassion and empathy um, and zero judgment. It's, uh, I mean, it, it, I think the people that you're talking to and that you're reporting on are lucky to have someone with that view because I imagine it's not always a universal one. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, you want to be able to report on a story. So keeping that in mind as you're going through the process, you know, obviously as a mental health company, we think is first and foremost the priority. Um, are there stories, you know, if you think about your career, are there stories you hope to cover in the future? Are there you know, things you would love to report on or topics that you hope that you get the chance to, to cover? I mean, yeah, I, there's, you know, I've been lucky to cover some topics that for me felt, you know, very purposeful and um, really important and substantive. You know, I think we're just sort of scratching the surface in terms of, you know, sexual harassment in sports um, and the treatment of women in sports, you know, that's something that obviously I feel very strongly about, you know, having been through some of those things myself. Um, and, you know, I, you know, it's for me, I, sexual misconduct and abuse in sports is something that I feel like is so pervasive and so rampant and so underreported and under scrutinized that scrutinize that, you know, it really feels like that's something where I would like to, you know, continue focusing my efforts in the future. And why do you think it's underreported? That's a great question. Uh, I think there's a lot of layers to that answer. I think people, um, you know, when we talk about like predators or abusers, I think we expect them to look like the boogeyman, right? Like someone jumping out of the bushes in a trench coat. And that's very rarely the case. Um, more often, it is our neighbor or a beloved teacher or a coach, someone that has been, um, you know, that we're intimately familiar with and you might have over to dinner at your house, you might go have beers with, like, who has been helpful and kind in the past. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a reason that people sometimes turn a blind eye or don't always recognize signs immediately is because it's really uncomfortable to confront the fact that, you know, this is relatively common and it, you know, it happens amongst us. These people are our neighbors. Um, you know, there are, there are, you know, city council member, there are, you know, aldermen, whatever. Um, and I think that's really hard. I think the other element is, you know, whenever I write a story about abuse, it, there's one part of my reporting that generally focuses on the abuse itself. Um, but almost always there will be another element of, you know, institutional protectionism or institutional mm -hmm. betrayal, some sort of enabling. 
uh, that happens at a very institutional level. And, and there's a lot of reasons that, you know, from a structural standpoint, um, there are protections uh, for, for unsavory characters, unfortunately. And I think that comes down to the fact that, you know, especially in sports, like sports revolve so heavily around um, money and power and cachet. And so, you know, when you have those things consolidating and really concentrated power structures, I think that's when very scary situations can happen. So I guess one of my questions is, you know, when you think about the young burgeoning athlete, regardless of the sport, but somebody who hasn't yet become a household name, just given the dynamics you're discussing about the institutional nature and the motivations around power and money, you know, what motivates someone to say, yes, this is a story I'm comfortable telling? You know, I, I guess I, in some ways, see it as almost easier if someone has credibility and they can go backwards in time and say, I struggled with this because the public already has an opinion. My guess is it's a much riskier proposition for someone who's just in the beginning stages of creating that career and is a minor or is a young person. You know, what do you think motivates them and, and how do we change the systems um, so that these issues don't come up in the future? Yeah, that's, you know, there's a lot that goes into that, which is, you know, one of the big things is the average age, I think, of like child sex abuse disclosure is around the age of 52. Um, so it, it is rare to get someone contemporaneously reporting abuse because I think there's a lot of different emotions involved, fear, shame, guilt, um, you know, anxiety about the implications on your own career, your own livelihood, your own place in an organizational hierarchy. Um, and that can be really difficult to combat. Again, it goes down to, you know, especially for minors, like we all hope that, um, you know, our kids are surrounded by people who are looking out for them and acting in their best interests. Um, but, you know, I do think that just like we talked earlier about how conversations about mental health are evolving, I also do think that, you know, conversations about this particular topic, like abuse and misconduct um, has evolved as well. And I do think, you know, athletes now are, are more empowered than ever before. And I think they're sort of harnessing the power of their own like voice and experience and social media is a part of that too. So I think, you know, continuing to empower athletes and educate them about, you know, what is and what is not appropriate you know, what sort of things violate boundaries and are, mm -hmm. you know, not above board and, you know, encouraging them to speak up when, when they feel like something is amiss. But, you know, we can't be just putting, again, onus on the athletes themselves. There also does need to be a, a much greater responsibility on organizations and institutions to protect, especially when it comes to minors and younger athletes. I have a bit of a random question, um, which is, you know, how often are you in the situation where you're investigating a story and suddenly the dynamics change and somebody says, you know what, actually, I'm not comfortable disclosing this anymore, or you're finding something that suggests that, you know, your original take on the story might be different than what you assumed and you have to pivot. Um, you know, how, do, how does that impact you as a career? I would imagine I think about most careers, you know, if you put in the effort and you kind of do a repeatable pattern, you have a sense of what the results are. And my sense as a reporter is you have to always be open to the inevitable happen, to totally changing the direction. But, you know, what do you do if somebody pops up halfway through a story and becomes reluctant or if the facts change in a different direction? Sort of how do you manage that uncertainty? So if someone um, suddenly becomes uncomfortable and wants to pull back and, um, you know, I don't want to say rescind their participation, but at least rethink their participation. Like, that's a no brainer for me. Again, it goes back to respecting people's experience and understanding that they are not, those are not my stories to tell. Um, and I have to be respectful for the people whose stories they belong to. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, I have a pretty aggressive personality. <laughs> and that's part of, you know, what I think helps me as a reporter. But when it comes to stories like these, I do not push. Um, I think mm -hmm. patience is a much better approach and it's been one that has worked 
you know, much more effectively for me as, um, as I've, you know, explored these stories. So what I always tell people is just like, hey, that is your prerogative. And for this to work, you have to feel comfortable. And if you don't feel comfortable, then let's take a step back or pump the brakes. And you ball is in your court and you let me know, um, you know, when, when you'd like to reignite discussions or get back into these conversations. And I've had, I've had plenty of stories that, you know, I've, I've invested a lot of time in and, you know, people have gotten cold feet or, you know, have rethought their participation and there's no hard feelings. Like, like I said, you know, you, you put them on the back burner and you keep them there until, you know, sometimes people change their mind again. And, um, and, and you just understand that, especially like for when you think about trauma, like trauma has all these really sort of insidious byproducts and effects and mm -hmm. um, they affect people in very nonlinear ways. So they can be doing okay and then they can sort of regress and have, you know, periods where they, you know, feel a lot worse. And I think it's really, you know, important to be mindful and respectful of that. And there are some times when, um, you know, the fact patterns of a story kind of change. And so, you know, I always, I take all allegations seriously and I look into them all um, in a very robust way. Um, but, you know, it's also my responsibility as a reporter and as a journalist to vet things thoroughly, not just for myself and for my publication, but for the person whose story it is to tell it, you know, if, if things are not lining up, um, sometimes it's not a matter necessarily of whether or not I believe them, but, you know, whether a story can hold up to scrutiny or whether it's going to, you know, potentially cause them some real harm and blowback if they decide to move forward. Um, so I try to think about it as like a pretty collaborative conversation with the person that, you know, I'm, I'm speaking with and, and to make them feel involved in the process. Have you ever had concerns when the story, you know, the subject matter of the story, the person who is, you know, the, the person perpetrating the crimes or guilty of um, maybe not in the court of law, but the person who's perceived as the, as the aggressor, you know, is in the public eye. Have you ever had concerns for either your personal safety or just blowback from that individual because of the status that they retain um, in our society? Yeah, I mean, I deal with a fair amount of blowback. I would say in my job, there's plenty of people who'd probably push me off a cliff if they had the chance to do it. <laughs> um, I'm not getting like Christmas cards from a bunch of people and that's okay. Like that, that is the occupational hazard. Like you're not going to be liked by a lot of people if you're an investigative reporter because you're often like, you know, mining things that are not pleasant or easy to deal with. And that can have really significant implications for others. Um, and that's fine. Like that's, that's, I, I sleep fine at night. Like that's the nature <laughs> of my work. And I feel very, um, you know, driven by doing, you know, right by people and, um, you know, giving voice to people who don't necessarily have that and, you know, exploring some of the more seedy underworld of sports and some of the real harm that has been caused. And if that causes me any blowback, like I'm totally comfortable with that. I have to be pretty private about, you know, my personal life. And, you know, I don't um, talk about my kids very much publicly or post pictures mm -hmm. of them. Um, and, you know, that's something I kind of just in extra measure that I take just because um, because of the subject matter. Yeah. You have to be a brave person to do what you're doing, for sure. Um, related to that question, you know, how do you take care of yourself, given that so much of what you're dealing with, I imagine, isn't uplifting? How do you think about, you know, that that term that I think has been so over publicized self-care? Self-care. Yep. I was, gonna, <laughs> I was anticipating it. I was bracing for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the first thing I think is like really, you know, recognizing when that becomes an issue. And that was not something that was immediately apparent to me when I was first doing it. But I've become better at sort of recognizing when, you know, the subject matter has this sort of like incremental effect of building up and building up. And um, it can get dark. Like, I, I won't lie. Like, it can get really tough. It can get dark. It's 
can be depressing. Sometimes you feel like, you know, it's a very Sisyphusian task and like what you're doing can feel futile and the wheels of justice don't always move as quickly as you want. And it's just, you know, a lot of the stuff is really heavy um, mm -hmm. uh, as a reporter, as a human being, as a mother, certainly um, that's been difficult to deal with. So recognizing it one, you know, trying to find sort of healthy outlets outside of work. Like I have a great, you know, support system of family and friends, um, you know, going outside for walks, like meeting friends and not talking about work, uh, working out is like very, you know, doing the things that you like that are not, um, you know, affiliated with work. And I also have a wonderful therapist um, who like probably knows more about like the sports investigative world than she would ever <laughs> her to. I just like, you know, I'm always like, oh, I don't really have that much to talk about. And then I just dump like, you know, an hour worth of like work venting onto her. So she's like sort of intimately aware of the intricacies and nuance of every single story that I'm chasing and the impact it's had. And she's great. Like, um, that's probably been the single most beneficial like tool for me is just to have mm -hmm. someone, um, neutral and that's not in like, it's not a family member so, and it's not someone involved in the business. So she has really wonderful perspective and she has helped me to, um, you know, make some sort of leaps in terms of awareness and certain things have crystallized and, you know, preparing me with certain like tools to deal with it when it gets, you know, dark. So if one of your children came to you and said, this is the career path they want to pursue, you know, what would be your reaction and your advice? So, you know, I, when I was growing up, my dad always told me like, you know, do what you love and, you know, don't, don't worry about status or money and do what you love. And if you do what you love, it won't feel like work. And I, and I can truly say that like about my job, my job is tough and it can be stressful. And there are days that are really difficult, but I do love my job and I do feel a real sense of purpose from my job. And, you know, it, it, it does feel very, um, I have a lot of creative fuel and to me, it does feel impactful. And all, those are all like priorities for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think I, what I would tell my kid is like, we'll support you in anything that you want to do as long as it's important to you. Because, you know, I'm a big believer that if, if you're really passionate about what you do, um, that will be reflected in the quality and care of your work. And so, you know, there are, are certain things that I, it would be hard for me and stressful for me as a mother for my kids to go through. But at the end of the day, I would want to be supportive about their own, you know, dreams and passions and interests. That's great. Well, thank you, Katie, so much for being a guest on our podcast today. Really appreciate your time. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. And thank you to all our listeners and our viewers today. If you're so inclined, please give us a positive review on your podcast platform of choice. And we look forward to having you on our next podcast. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.